All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Adam, and I'm here with Matt, and we're presenting our prototype ion thruster for microsatellites, and we were supervised by Professor Bo Sui, who is the director of the Waterloo Nanofabrication Lab. Next slide, please. So, uh, as far as what I'll be covering in this presentation, we're gonna do an introduction to CubeSats and microsatellites and thrusters. Then we're gonna talk about what motivated us to do all this R&D over the last eight months to make our design project. And I'll talk about the simulations, the decisions we made that led to the final product. And then we'll have some concluding remarks and then questions at the end. Next slide. So uh, here are all the people in the group. And as you can see by the disciplines that are involved here, we've divided the, the project this way. There's a lot of things going on. So, but generally speaking, uh, Christopher and I were doing the electrical, mechanical, and electronics work. And then Matthew and Richard were in the lab doing the wet chemistry, photolithography, and the chemical processing. Uh, next slide. So what are CubeSats? So on the desk there, this is a CubeSat. So our project was done in partnership with the Waterloo Satellite Design Team. And this is their satellite from last year. So this is just a structure, nothing inside. This is the new one. Which is, as, you, as you can see, it's very packed inside. So CubeSats are interesting because they're a very rapidly growing sector of the aerospace industry. And the reason is because they're basically cheap. You can develop this one, say, for 50 grand. And you can develop them very quickly. So by quickly, we're talking two years. So there are companies, for example, there's a company in Cambridge that has a small fleet of CubeSats, and they use these CubeSats to log uh, where cargo ships are over the earth and provide a live map of where these ships are. So companies and, and governments are interested in that data and they sell that data. So that's just an application. But there are many, including space science, so people, if you're studying, say, the atmosphere, if you want to monitor, say, your CO2 emissions, the, the Indian government is developing a CubeSat for that application. So there are many uses. But I want you to just notice that it's very packed, and that's kind of important when it comes to our design constraints. Next slide, please. So if you have a CubeSat with an engine or a thruster, that really is quite an opportunity. So you can extend the life of your satellite by just keeping it up there longer, by fighting the drag forces that will bring you down over time. You can also use it for stabilization. So if I have a very high precision instrument and I'm pointing it at one part of the Earth, I need to keep myself very focused and very steady. So you can do that with propulsion. Uh, you can also execute orbital maneuvers. So say I'm done using, you know, scanning this part of the Earth in this orbit, I'm gonna change my orbit slightly to you know, change my mission a little bit. And at the end of your life, you can turn your satellite basically just right back towards the Earth and burn it up very quickly rather than have it linger high up in the atmosphere, just being a hazard to other people who want to put up satellites. So right now, uh, the propulsion sy systems that are available for these satellites, they have many problems, so like for the small size. So they, en they end up relying on compressed gases and tanks. So it means you have a big heavy tank, you have valves, it takes up a lot of room. So if, if you can look at that satellite there, you can imagine that half of that space will be just taken up by a tank and just valves and control systems to make sure that you can control your propulsion system. So that means that you're not really gonna have much of a satellite by the time you put propulsion on it. And plus, these systems aren't really mass produced, so, and they don't scale down well at all, as I mentioned. So in general, people don't really put propulsion on CubeSats. Next slide, please. So what we would need is pretty much something that's the opposite of what I've described. It needs to be inexpensive, you need to be able to mass produce it, it needs to let you do orbital maneuvers, and it needs to be fuel efficient because I can't fill up my CubeSat with fuel. So what would it look like? Well, it would look something like this. Uh, this is a cross-sectional view of our ion thruster that we've designed. So our customer is WATSAT, the Waterloo Satellite Design Team, as I mentioned, and we have a few requirements from them. So they have a power budget, they have solar panels to gather power, so our uh, thrust, thruster has to use less than two watts. In fact, it uses about a half a watt. The volume it has has to fit within a CubeSat, including the control systems, the fuel, and it also has to extend the lifetime of the CubeSat by 50%. So that's an important number, and I'll explain why later. Next slide. So we have three components to our iron thruster. We've shown here kind of in an exploded view. So at the top, we have a metal extraction grid. In the middle, we have a microfabricated uh, array of emitters on this porous metal, which is nickel. And we have a glass ceramic housing at the base, which is mounted to the CubeSat. And our fuel is an ionic liquid. So you can think of it as like sink of molten salt, but liquid at room temperature, a mixture of positive and negative ions. Uh, next slide, please. So how does it work? Well, we have a fuel reserve. So the ionic liquid is filling the capillaries, the pores of this uh, porous substrate that we've etched. So a large part of our project was spent making these emitter tips very precisely um, using our custom-made electrochemical etching station and our process. Um, so the other part is we have an extraction grid, and the holes in the extraction grid are lined up with the emitters. 
So what happens is that the emitter tips, they concentrate the electric field at the tip, basically through the formation of Taylor cones as the ionic liquid is pulled up through the pores and forming the, these Taylor cones. Uh, then a strong electric field basically rips off a small droplet and we electrostatically accelerate it out at extremely high speed. So that's how we get our thrust. Next slide. So now we're getting back to this mission life I was talking about. So 50%, where does that number come from? Um, so here we have a graph, a simulation that we did. So the y-axis is the altitude in kilometers that you are, your satellite is holding above the Earth. So we did the simulation for that satellite, but fully loaded, so at four kilos. So the lowest altitude as part of the Canadian Satellite Design Challenge that Wattsat could be placed at is 600 kilometers. So this is what happens, the blue curve is what happens when Wattsat satellite is put up and its orbit decays over time. So a Wattsat satellite will burn up in about 60 months like, then there's nothing they can do about it. It's just up there and that it will burn up eventually. However, if we have one ion thruster firing to counter the drag forces that are presented by the atmosphere, you can, you, you can be on the green curve, and the green curve is at 90 months. So it means if you're a company, this is quite interesting. You can go from putting up, say, three satellites a year to putting up two satellites a year, and to launch that satellite, it costs you a quarter of a million dollars. So it's a big deal. It'll save a lot of money. Next slide, please. So, we also did other simulations to help guide our engineering. So this is a simulation used in COMSOL, uh, which is a multi-physics program of the extraction grid. So what we wanted to check here is, is this grid going to flex too much under the electrostatic force that we're putting it on and to cause it eventually to fail? So what the result of the simulation was that we, had, we chose a 70 micron thick molybdenum plate, uh, well, quite thin, obviously, and it only deflects about 1%, which is good enough for us. And the ancillary benefit of this is that during fabrication, like when you're laser cutting holes into it, it doesn't warp as much. So if we had chosen, say, stainless steel, we'd have warping and that would make it really difficult for us to put our device together. Next slide. So another simulation we did is the emitter. So this is a kind of one side of the emitter. You can imagine it kind of spun in 3D. And what, it tell, what the simulation is doing is it's telling us how we should design our spacing. So what we want to find out is the tip to grid distance that will minimize our off-axis emission. So we want our ions to go straight out and not strike the extraction grid because that boosts our power costs and doesn't give any more thrust. So that's something we really want to avoid. So what we found from the simulation of the electric field gradient inside the device is that two things. We, we have the optimum distance at 100 microns from tip to extraction grid and that the extraction grid holes should be slightly enlarged so we don't have this striking of the ions against the, the extraction grid. Next slide. So um, the last simulation we did was a, a console, well actually a SOLIDWORKS simulation of the performance of the MACOR ceramic housing. So, well we didn't know it was going to be MACOR, but basically what we wanted to find was a material that was sufficiently strong to withstand the g-force generated during launch, whilst also being electrically insulating. It's because we don't want to short our device to the structure of the satellite, that wouldn't be very good. So what we did is we simulated the g-force in two axes, so this axis and this, this picture we're showing in one axis. And what we found is that MACOR, which is an aerospace engineering ceramic, is more than sufficient uh, in both axes to withstand the, the forces generated during launch. And the other benefit of it is that it's very easily machinable, which means that the companies that are making it for us can supply it very quickly. And also, it's a, because it's space grade, it doesn't outgas, which is obviously a constraint when we're building something that has to fit into a satellite and not cause problems. Uh, next slide. So now Matt's going to talk about the process for making this. So a uh, big part of this is that we need to make sure that our emitter tips are properly aligned with our extraction grid. And to make sure that we have that, we're going to use a photolithography process. So to start, we use a dry film photoresist. Now this is slightly atypical for most uh, micro-machining processes. Typically you would use a liquid photoresist. But because we have a porous substrate, the photoresist would actually wick into the pores and it would ruin the development and uh, the etching. So it's very important that we use the dry photoresist. So first we started with an acid dip to remove the nickel oxide that had formed and uh, then laminate the photoresist on. We expose with UV and develop uh, rinsing and drying and that leads us to our electrochemical etching process.
Um, so we did some of that, and uh, on this image here is just a picture after development of some of our drive uh, photoresist. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but there are tiny blue dots in the middle of that square, and those are about 200 micron diameter caps that are used to form our emitter tips when the electrochemical etching occurs. Uh, but that wasn't enough for us, so we took that into the uh, scanning electron microscope and did a backscattering electron image. And what we found was that we had really good contrast. So the bright areas are where the, the nickel is, and you can see the porous substrate. Uh, it's really rigid and bumpy. Uh, and then you can see the dark circles, and because the photoresist is used of uh, a lighter material, it appears darker in backscattering mode. So what we can really see here is the development has given us really good contrast, which is important. Next slide. So now moving on to the electrochemistry. Uh, the first thing that we had to do with the assistance of Watsat uh, was to actually build an electrochemical etch station. So uh, part of this was is that we have a really specific uh, design and it starts with an aluminum frame and we have two uh, linear actuators. Uh, one is aimed to put our electrode right above the, uh, the nickel chip very uniformly every single time. And the other one is to stir the solution in a very uniform way where we can control the acceleration and speed. Um, so we also built a custom electrode to hold the substrate so that the nickel chip wasn't moving around during the etching. Uh, we are also using a pulse etch and that helps keep uh, uh, us operating in a diffusion limited regime, which is important because if it isn't in this regime, then the pores tend to open up and that's what we don't want. We want to keep our pore size uh, exactly the way that we ordered it. And then we can precisely control how much we've etched uh, due to a Coulomb counter integrated into the system that uh, Chris and Adam designed in to make sure that when we put a nickel substrate there, uh, we etch the exact same amount every single time. Next slide. So we have some of our initial results shown here. Uh, you can see that we're starting to develop the emitter profile shape. That's about 120 microns tall, uh, with the tip size around 20, 30 micron, which is in the range that we're looking for. Um, we also have been able to show a fairly uniform etch over a large substrate, uh, and that's because of the paddle motion over, over the entire substrate. Uh, another key part of the design is actually the thickness of the dry film photoresist that we're using. So these tips start getting really sharp points. And what's been found in literature is that dry films around 60 microns in thickness will actually break the tips, which essentially ruins your etch. So we've selected a, uh, a dry film for resist that's only 16 microns thick, and literature has shown that that won't uh, cause breaking of the tips. Next slide. So after assembling all of this, uh, we need a test station. So we're talking about operating in space, which means that we need a fairly hard vacuum. So uh, we were able to obtain one here on campus and that pumps down to 10 to the negative seven tor. And essentially our setup operates by having our thruster right across from a parallel plate that is used to collect the ions. So we fire up our molybdenum extraction grid to two kilovolts. And that rips out the ions, having them bombarded to the plate. And we can measure this current. The reason we're measuring current is because our, our calculated thrust is only on the order of micronewtons, which becomes very difficult to measure using uh, typical force gauges. So we're measuring the current instead across the resistor on an oscilloscope. And that's how we can measure and uh, our, our current. And then based on that, we can calculate the thrust based on how much we're accelerating the ions out of our extraction grid. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So now talking about actually doing this. So we had a little problem with our timeline. Back in December, we ordered 150 nickel substrates from our supplier uh, with a four week lead time. And we found that by mid-February, we still hadn't received these yet. And we tried contacting the company and then the university tried contacting the company. And essentially we found that they most likely went out of business. So we did not receive any of our 150 forest nickel substrates for testing. Uh, so this put us in a bit of a predicament to entering March and only a couple of weeks away because we didn't have time to cancel the order and order some from new. What we did obtain were a couple of free samples. Now six of these were small circular nickel discs that uh, were too small to be incorporated inside of our design, but we did actually uh, obtain four large circular nickel discs that were larger than the substrates that we were ordering. So with the help of WhatsApp, and Chris Backhouse might remember me frantically running around campus one day looking for a way um, to uh, get these machined, but with the help of WhatsApp on campus, we were able to machine them into 1.5 by 1.5 
five centimeter grids, these four, and we thin the, the substrates using our electrochemical etch station that we built. Next slide. Um, so we showed you a lot of results. Those were mostly done on the six button chips, as we call them, uh, to get all of our data. Um, then we went to work on the four, uh, four substrates that we had machined and sized properly. And essentially, we assembled a couple of thrusters, about two. So we had a make or housing, the molybdenum extraction grid, and the etched porous nickel substrates all combined. We aligned using a top-down microscope to make sure that the emitter tips were right underneath the holes. And then we were able to actually test two of our thrusters in a vacuum chamber. Uh, however, we were unable to get conclusive results. Um, unfortunately, we feel like we might have abused the nickel chips in the process of getting them into the right shape. Um, so we weren't really able to. We also saw that there was uh, quite a lot of noise in our setup whenever we tried to test. So unfortunately, we weren't able to get conclusive results. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, uh, we developed a high-speed, low-cost process for developing these thrusters. We built an electrochemical etch station for actually manufacturing them. Uh, we've used extensive use of simulations to basically select our materials used in our design to make sure that they'll work the first time. Uh, have demonstrated fairly correct geometry from our etch along with some very uniform etches across the surface. We just haven't been able to get them onto one chip yet. Um, and we performed some vacuum chamber testing with a bit of noise. So for our future work, um, we're looking to improve the photolamination process for more regular cap formations. That was one of the drawbacks that we had with, um, with the last couple of etches. We weren't forming the caps properly. Uh, we would like to refine our electrochemical etch process to make sure that it's, it's making the correct geometries, uh, along with uh, adopting our test procedure to make sure that we reduce the, uh, the electrical noise. And then after that, once we have something tested, we want to integrate it with Watsat 2 uh, so that they can use it in their competition next year. Uh, we'd like to finish up by acknowledging Professor Bokui for his lab space and assistance with this process, along with uh, Dan Courtney. He is the uh, PhD student who originally inspired this work and actually helped us out when we had a lot of questions about the process. Uh, we'd like to thank our financial support from the Engineer of the Future Trust Fund and WhatsApp. Uh, we'd like to thank Jen Coggin for putting up with all of our headaches, especially when we are looking for alternative ways to get these nickel chips. Uh, and then finally, Professor uh, Rick Collum for letting us use his vacuum chamber. Hmm. Thank you. And do you have any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, okay. yeah. What was your ionic liquid? Uh, we were using an ion liquid called EMI IM. Yeah. And, uh, Part of the reason why we selected that ionic liquid is because both the positive and negative components actually have very similar mass, which allows for uh, even extraction. Uh, and part of the, what we didn't actually get to talk about is that we don't just charge it to two kilovolts in one uh, orientation, we actually flip the signal every second to make sure that we don't charge up our satellite because then it would become a tractor beam and things would just collide with it. Yeah. The other benefit of the field is that it's also a liquid from the range of temperatures that would be <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the Russians have a fit. Uh, they used to be the experts in this. They, yeah. Their systems had a real failure mode. Yeah. But I think yours might be immune to it, so we should have checked with that one. Was it, is it the grid abrasion, or, or is it something yeah, else? Yeah, erosion of the Yeah, grid. yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, I well, yeah, we'll talk about it. Uh, well, the ions hit pretty hard, but yeah, we'll talk about it after, because. Sure. Simple question. What's your chemistry question? OK. You say somewhere where you're doing etching that you need to stay in the Limited regime. What other regime is that? And why? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there, um, if I recall correctly, there's the current limited regime as well. Or, uh, sorry, actually, sorry, the uh, migration, like basically migration of the ions in solution. But we want to. Actually, maybe Richard, can you explain it better? Because I'm not very good at this one. This was more our setting process. Okay. The um, problem with the regime that we would be operating in without agitation from liquid is that we would start to. Um, up the acid that is in the area underneath the cap. So we would get that undercutting effect that we need. Um, so by applying the pulse etch, what we could actually do is allow the electric double layer that would form along the substrate to dissipate and allow us to continually etch all areas at the same rate, regardless of the rate at which liquid 
it was also reported in literature that using a pull stretch reduced the opening of the pores, which we want to use their capillary forces for uh, bringing up the ionic liquid to the top of the tip. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. If you have any questions, we can talk. Yeah. <laughs>